Hi, I'm Tim of the Watchbox and welcome to Dubai Watch Week 2019. Many of you will know that my all-time best viewed video, thanks to you folks, is of a Resonance Type 3 and I have the man himself, founder and chief of Resonance, Benoit Mintian. Benoit, thank Hello. you for being here. Thank you. We got to talk about how you get to the end result from wherever you're starting because your watches look like nothing, they wear like nothing, they operate like nothing else. So how do you design a watch from start to finish? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, what uh, makes a restaurant different is that we don't actually design the watch first. We first design the relationship to the watch. Um, and we think that is uh, a fundamental thing that you have to do if you want to be, if you want to have, let's not forget, a watch is something you wear on you. It's part of you. It's like glasses. Uh, um, so you need to really think, okay, I have an interaction, uh, I have a relationship with that product uh, and so yeah, I think for us the, 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 big, the biggest th challenge that we have, every time we make a new model, you talked about the Type 3, it's the same for the Type 2 now or, or even the Type 1, um, we really search in let's say the broader ergonomical field uh, to think okay how, how can we improve things how can we make a better watch? Meaning, how can that watch fit you better? Instead of, yeah, sometimes engineers uh, tend to find a solution, a technical solution, uh, and then yeah, the consumer has to adapt to it. Well, I think it's the opposite should be uh, what, what people should do in design, and that is uh, really to make uh, um, the product uh, adapt to the user. It's sort of along the lines of why you adopted the hand as your company symbol. It's welcoming, uh, it's sort of a handshake as much as a hand. Yes. And I indeed. would say a couple of your innovations, using titanium to be light on the wrist, uh, adopting thinner base movements to make the watches more slender, yeah. adopting the case back lever, all of this is geared toward ergonomics. Mm -hmm. But you've also talked about the watch still needing to function as a watch and your display yep. system, yep. the orbital planetary is incredible, mm -hmm. but it's also very readable. There are yep. some independence with alternative time displays mm -hmm. that are incomprehensible. So how did you first decide to do something different than a normal three hand? Yep. And then how did you settle on the regulator hmm. planetary display? Yeah, uh, wide question. Um, so the reason why uh, we do this is because again, I, re I would relate it to uh, ergonomics. In this case, um, the fact that our uh, dial is flat, is, uh, is one surface, has, has to do or is, is a consequence of the fact that we have two eyes and it's easier to read um, uh, information that is two-dimensional than information that is three-dimensional. So you mentioned uh, many of my colleagues that make amazing uh, display uh, systems, but most of them are three-dimensional. It's also to show the technicity of the watch. Uh, whereas we, uh, the technicity is hidden behind, um, behind a kind of yeah, a sheet of paper where words would be written on, uh, because uh, ergonomically it's the fastest way to read things. The reason why is because when we look at a three-dimensional object, our brain needs to transform the, the two different visions it gets from the left and the right eye uh, into a mono uh, image then send it to the brain to understand what you are reading. If this image is already two-dimensional, the two eyes see the same thing, and so the process is faster. Uh, okay, on a watch, you would say, okay, yes, it's not so three-dimensional, normal watch, I would say. But imagine yourself, you're reading a book, and the, the words that are printed normally on that book would not pr be printed, but float above the paper. Um, it would take you five to ten times longer to read the page uh, because of the fact that your brain constantly needs to focus on every word and transform that into a two-dimensional information. So what you're saying is when there's too much depth of field on a dial, yep. it becomes counterintuitive and challenging to read. Yes, it's, it's just not natural. It's, it's just more efficient. Uh, and, and it's, again, to this relationship. So now you've responded to the market in various ways since you first launched Resonance and obviously the Type 5, giving people the swimmable dive style watch that, that's very popular in the market. Mm -hmm. But then with the Type 2 and the E-Crown system, you arguably addressed a need for which there wasn't yet 
a groundswell of demand. How did you anticipate the need for the Type 2 and could you explain why it's not a smart watch? Okay, um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's certainly not a smart watch. Uh, as we describe a smart watch category, uh, it's a mechanical watch. Uh, it's 100% mechanical. Uh, you can take out uh, the electronics. It would run like any mechanical watch. Um, you could even physically remove the electronics, it would just run. Uh, there's even a position where you can put it off the electronics. Um, but it, it's just uh, giving, uh, again, I would relate to uh, this relationship. Um, uh, I'm not a watchmaker, I'm not even a Swiss, um, I, and I didn't live the quartz crisis uh, like some did, and most brands, the old brands, they all went through that. Um, <clears throat> so for, um, for us, uh, adding electronics uh, is actually, uh, there's no taboo for us to do it. Um, uh, like the car industry added uh, electronics in the 80s to their cars just to make them better cars. Uh, well, we believe that we just make a better watch by adding a little bit of electronics not for the function, not for the base function uh, of the watch, uh, so the timekeeping, uh, but it's E-Crown stands for electronic crown. So we only, um, yeah, let's say, automated the functions uh, that a crown does on a, on a regular watch. And so it has the ability to self-energize, it has the ability to track two time zones, it has the ability to set but not control the mechanical base movement. Yeah. And you've come up with a new uh, method of interacting with your watch. Of course, you've traditionally had the case back setting and the case back winding, yep. but now you also have a dial side control. Could you talk yep. a little bit about how you determined that a dial side control was appropriate for setting the watch with the e-crown? Well, <clears throat> it goes back to this intuitiveness. Um, <clears throat> when you look at computers uh, from the 80s, uh, you had to have had some kind of uh, uh, studies in uh, IT uh, to be able to use it in a proper way. And today, uh, a three-year-old or three year old kid can uh, open an iPad and check for the images. Um, meaning that, referring to this adaptation, the product, the iPad or the tablet, has adapted to the user. Um, whereas in the beginning, uh, people had to adapt to this machine. Well this same logics of intuitiveness, we try to apply it to a watch. Uh, if you say, wake up, you wake up. And you literally tap it. And, and you response. tap the watch. It's, it's really this, this, um, this interaction that we try to find with, uh, with the watch uh, that we, uh, yeah, we, we want to apply uh, really in a daily use. Yeah. Instead of a crown that you have to search, break your nails, uh, things like that, you know, it's again, try to adapt the product to the user. It's natural. Wake up. It is indeed intuitive. Uh, and I'd also have to say, just in terms of the way your watches have been designed from the beginning, very early on there was a crown and you moved away from that. Yep. You moved to the case back setting, the crownless profile. Uh, how do you combine aesthetics and ergonomics without favoring one over the other? Well, <clears throat> in the beginning, <laughs> I wasn't that smart. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go through a process. Uh, I couldn't do e-crown uh, day one. Huh? It's, it's, uh, it's a process. Uh, it's a learning curve where we go through. Um, and uh, the, the fact that we took away uh, the crown is, is again a, uh, a typical invention of an engineer to put a crown on the watch. Um, it's not a good idea. It's just something he had to find a solution it's for. It's inherited from the pocket watch era. Yeah. But it's not a good solution. It's too small. It if it's big, it hurts. If it's and then you make it small, but then you can't use it. So it's it's just not a good a good concept. Uh, so we thought, all right, let's let's turn it around. And also, yeah, the architecture of Renaissance allows it uh, that you could just uh, turn the complete movement uh, on the back. Uh, so the movement in Renaissance is not a fixed thing. It's it's turning with the back. So um, you just turn the back, you turn the whole movement, so you turn the dial. So now you have watches that are filled with oil 
and watches that feature, I, I guess you could call them magnetic clutches to connect yeah. no. the base to the module. With most watches, if I said it's full of fluid and it's magnetized, you'd tell me uh, you're going to get a big service bill. Yeah. Uh, it's broken. So how do you yeah. prevent the Type 3 and the Type 5 with both magnets and fluid in the watch mm -hmm. From becoming contaminated or self-destructing, how do you yeah. firewall the delicate components from mm -hmm. the magnets and fluid? Our oil-filled watches are the toughest of all the watches we have, thanks to the oil. They are the better, the best watches. They run be the best. Let's say they need the least energy to run. Uh, they rarely need maintenance on the oil side. I, I can count it in one hand, all the maintenance we had to do on an oil-filled watch since we launched it. Uh, because oil uh, protects everything that is inside. Um, so all these gears, and on the Type 3 it's more than 200 parts inside the oil. Uh, they're all protected in a kind of yeah, hermetically sealed off environment, a bit like a compass. Um, and as long as, or an egg, <laughs> it's a bit the same idea. Uh, it's all protected inside. So, you, it, and uh, to allow um, or to guarantee that there is never a leak, uh, we could not make a physical connection uh, because any gasket you would Im imagine would start to leak after a while. So that's why we came up with this uh, magnetic transmission because the movement itself, the balance wheel, cannot run in oil. So that part is always in air. And so we had to bring this uh, information, this minute information from the air side to the oil side. And we do that with a magnetic transmission. Also there, um, I didn't know it when I thought of it, but uh, a few years later, I found out that uh, my heating uh, in the house, the pump that pumps the water through the radiators, is the same idea. It's also with a magnetic transmission. The pump works the same way. So no, it's interesting you brought up service, because I've had a lot of people ask me about servicing with Resins, and they say, you know, Tim, I, I love the Type 3, but it must cost as much as a minute repeater with the oil-filled dial to mm -hmm. service. Are you saying it's much more like just a basic core movement service rather than a module and yeah. movement service? It's we, just the base movement? Yeah, we, we, we rarely have to service the oil side, really, very rarely. Um, it's usually, like any mechanical watch is the movement that we need to service, like regular servicing on any watch. And let's not, it's not rocket science to put oil in a watch. It's complicated to manage and you have to make sure that everything works. And I can tell you it cost a few years of my life <laughs> to find out how to do it. But uh, now that the process is, is, uh, is running, it's, it's okay, everything, everything goes well. Um, and the processes are there. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just you have to know how to do it. It's, it's not a very expensive service uh, if, if you have a problem in the oil side. And anyway, uh, usually... Uh, and with the oil basically set it and forget it, I guess the answer to our friends out in TV land is if you want to service a Resence, it's basically like servicing a 2824 or a 2892. Simple and universal. Let me ask you a question about growth because there's always that tension between maintaining the integrity of a brand and trying to grow at all costs. Right now you're making hundreds, not thousands of watches per year. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a limit to how fast you want to grow and is there maybe a limit ability to reach the customers, ability to, I guess, maintain the same level of quality control or service availability? Is there a limit to growth or is it just sky is the limit for an independent like yours? No. Um, <clears throat> Sky is not the limit because uh, what we do, uh, you have to understand that we make watches uh, and we put a lot of effort in what's happening inside the watch. That's, that's a little bit how you can describe uh, independence. They're all very much busy with the technique the, the, and, and the result is very complex uh, products. And when you say complex, you, you say a lot of money to produce. Uh, so. When you compare that to let the bigger brand, the, the ones you talk about or you refer to with thousands and ten thousand and hundred thousands of pieces, uh, these watches they cost a fraction of what, what we do. A, a fraction, when I say a fraction, it's like maybe two or three parts of our watches is the same price as a complete watch for these mass production. It's a completely different market. Uh, we, we are uh, we are not selling a brand, we are selling products. 
uh, we are selling a, a soul or, or the watchmaker or everyone or every independent brand has a little bit his yeah, his universe uh, in which he's working uh, but <clears throat> it's a it's a fundamental difference so it's never going to be a mass mass production product it's, forget it um, uh, for example we independents we won't have the problem that we will get easily Chinese copies uh, from our watches. It's just too expensive to make even for a Chinese. They cannot, they cannot make it so cheap. So it's just. And I like that your attitude towards limited editions is truly limited. Now you're wearing the, you're yep. a Siddiqui exclusive. Yep. And this particular watch, which is the first titanium type one squared, it's going to be 19 pieces? Yes. So 19 pieces. We are in 2019. There you go. It, quite, <laughs> that is a limited edition. And you never repeat your limited editions. There's not going to be an identical version with a blue dial. Of course not. Of course not. I, I always, uh, that's, that was, by the way, that was a problem because uh, Siddiqui said, yeah, we would like a skeleton. But we did already a skeleton uh, for Hodinki uh, a few years ago. So I said, no way, I'm not going to do it. So, uh, because I did it for them, and uh, I said, but I said, yeah, but it's nice that you see the mechanism. Blah, blah, blah. So I said, all right, um, let's let's find out what what we can do with uh, maybe uh, yeah an Arabic uh, an Arabic uh, um, environment or architecture or patterns or whatever geometries. And so try to combine uh, those different uh, things and, and make a watch really for, uh, for Siddiqui and, and that looks nice, that is still a essence uh, and makes sense for an environment that is the one of uh, Siddiqui. So really make a custom made uh, product. Now, one last question about the influence of the internet, because I've noticed Resence has one of the best websites of any brand at, at any size. I go on some major brand websites and I'm like, I wish this were as easy to use and beautifully illustrated as the Resent site. I've also realized, having shot a few Resent watches, that the YouTube response is almost at Rolex level. level. So do you think Resent appeals to a more online, younger, maybe more tech-savvy clientele? Because mm -hmm. it certainly seems like you're set up for it, and that's what my YouTube views are kind of indicating to me. Huh. Would we know why? <laughs> it would be easy. Uh, we would all do it. So. I believe, uh, my understanding is that uh, when you, for example, we, we did um, a little analysis of uh, the rate like, uh, the like rates uh, on Instagram. Um, it's a, a bit uh, dangerous to affirm it now, but uh, we, we are or we were not so long ago, I, I didn't check this morning, but uh, we had the highest like rate of the industry on Instagram when you take the percentage of likes compared to the followers uh, for, for the posts. This is just an official thing that you can check on Instagram. Uh, we checked all the brands we could imagine. We were always higher uh, in percentage. Um, so it's a bit related to, to what you say. <clears throat> I believe it's maybe the authenticity of what we do. Um, I'm not a bullshit guy. I always say things as they are and uh, I believe that uh, that pays off uh, in the end if you're real if you do real things and you don't say uh, you not, work not with pretending that you, you've been you, around since uh, 1650 or I something don't, like that no we are young brand for example very often uh, I, I'm, I'm very honest to my customers also um, and I say listen you are buying a brand that is nine or nearly ten years old you cannot expect, and we do innovations like, like no one does them uh, in the industry. Uh, don't expect from us that you have a, a product that has been tested for 50 years. It's not. Don't believe it. But if you have a problem, you will, we will always make sure uh, we address it, we will repair it, you will not have to pay for it, because our customers, it's less now, but in the beginning, they were they were really like pioneers. They were, they were a bit crazy. Uh, They're and, like and Apple I, customers. I, I don't know, but uh, anyway, I think that they gave me the chance uh, to to um, to start uh, this business, uh, and I want to thank them for that, taking that risk. Uh, and of course, these people, they, uh, they yeah, many of them will. The, the, we have a rule in the company: the, the the first generation of each model. 
uh, when, when uh, a customer sends it back for repair, he will never have to pay for it. Uh, because this person has given me the chance to start my business. And um, it, it's just a, a, um, yeah, a human thing, you know. Uh, in the end, uh, they trusted me. I, I need to give that back uh, in the end. And I don't know how much that relates to Instagram. But no, no, it's good. And I think the lesson we have here is be honest, do something new, take risks, take care of your client, and above all, for you out in TV land, like Rescents on Instagram. Benoit, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.